we do look after Harlem Museum than we have for the last, crikey, five and a half, six years. So it's still here, which is good news. Um, we're delighted to be here on today, this particular day, because, I mean, in certain terms, not everyone will agree with the historical accuracy, but 25th of March, 1947, is significant in the history of this town. Um, I think this is quite sweet. You might enjoy this. This is the next generation of historians. These are under 11s who've been doing a little workshop every now and again. They put together this, you know, imitation of the current rather enjoyable uh, logo, the motif for Harvard 70th. Um, so it, it's a good day to be here, and thank you for coming. I'm really grateful again to somebody who's an extraordinary friend of the museum and of the town, I think. Um, Stan Yuns uh, hardly needs introduction, but I'm going to do 30 seconds worth, which is to say the service, public service, is something I really do respect. And Stan has been in public service for a very long time as MP, MEP for a period of time, uh, also involved with town council, currently the chair of Harlow's Civic Society, which fights valiantly to make sure that the heritage that matters to us is guarded well and continues to develop uh, interest in another set of people coming after us and that we, we protect what we have. So Stan very kindly has been um, willing to give us a little flavour of the history of Harlow. When you have heard his talk, please do also have a little look through our light uh, touch of Gibbard's Gift Exhibition, which provides a, a short bit of narrative about the master planner, his years of development and his contribution to the town, which is up the corridor and in the gallery just behind us here, Gallery 5. I hope you'll enjoy that. Stan, thank you for being a friend of the museum, thank you for being a friend of the town, and I hope, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Stan. Now, although Harlow is thought of as a new town, and we've come along here today because this is actually the 70th anniversary to the day of the designation of Harlow as a new town, it is also a very old town with a history stretching back into the old Stone Age. Some Paleolithic or old Stone Age tools have been found. Mesolithic or Middle Age flints are found all over the area. There is furthermore evidence of Neolithic or new, new uh, Stone Age people coming here for the uh, first permanent or semi-permanent settlements about 4000 BC and beginning agriculture in the town. There are some eight prehistoric, prehistoric sites identified at Church Langley, at Percy Springs Wood, at the Tesco site and the old hut house farm and more recently more evidence of Stone Age activity and later developments have been found on New Hall Estates and Mike Jury sitting over here has, uh, suggests that more is coming to light on Mark Hall allotments. <clears throat> Some of these sites developed into Bronze Age sites, Iron Age villages and then Roman temples, the Roman temple came along and we have here quite a, uh, a lot of Roman remains. Harlow has a sacred temple site alongside River Way, which actually goes back to a pond barrow <coughs> in the Bronze Age, and then to a circular Iron Age uh, uh, temple, and then to a, uh, uh, a proper Roman brick building. And... Uh, uh, it, we have also up at, near the Gibbard Garden, which I chair, there is uh, what is thought to be a Roman villa which has never yet been excavated. So Harlow, as I say, is a very, very uh, uh, interesting historic place whose uh, 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 origins go back long before the new town. Could we, in fact, have the first slide, please? Now, the first slide, that's the Chapman and Andre map, which shows, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, situation in 1777. If you look over here, this is 
over Harlow Old Town here. There's Bromley's, which uh, uh, was, has been destroyed in our time. Mulberry Green and so on. Coming down here uh, uh, <coughs> to Burford Green and so on. Right, next slide please. Uh, this is Harlow in, 19, uh, uh, in 1873, actually, when it was getting more built up. Next, please. Uh, uh, another slide showing uh, uh, Harlow again in the past with the uh, uh, back street, four street, the high street here. Next slide, please. That is a picture of <coughs> the remains of the Roman temple site. Uh, uh, the Roman temple, actually. Uh, uh, I'm trying, I've been trying for ages to get that refurbished because uh, uh, it's not in a very good state at all now. But uh, that's when it was actually excavated and those rain <coughs> remains are still there. Next slide, please. <coughs> <clears throat> That's a picture of the Roman temple as we envisage it in its heyday. Next, please. And that is Harlow, probably uh, uh, in the Saxon period. And you will see that Harlow then consisted of a number, what is now the new town, a number of different parishes which were fairly long and narrow, which went from the River Stolt down here to uh, uh, the ridge at Hastingwood. Harlow, Latton, Nexwell, Great Parndon, and Little Parndon in between with two bits, one there. And <coughs> the division that was made when these were original, probably Saxon estates, was to give <coughs> the, the each estate access to the river where you could build a mill and also as it was near water there'd be lush uh, uh, meadow land here. Further up there was possible arable land and here was still forest where wood could be obtained both for fuel, for furniture and for building purposes. <coughs> now <coughs> The history of Harlow uh, from about uh, 500 AD when the, the Romans left in 410. The history uh, after, four, after 410 doesn't uh, uh, show up much in the archaeological sense like the Romans. There are in fact several what are thought to be the remains of timber buildings in Harlow, but very little from the Saxon period. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, these uh, uh, Mulberry Green, uh, uh, which is up here in Harlow, Mulberry Green was originally Mulberry Green and was probably the place <coughs> for meetings when the Saxons were around. When the uh, Normans conquered England in 1066, they ousted all the Saxon landowners and created manors or medieval estates which were granted to the Norman lords in return for promising military support for the king. And Harlebury, uh, if you've not been, go along and have a look at it sometime, is one of the oldest houses, domestic houses, Religious in Inglebury St Edmunds, and in fact, uh, uh, the house itself is uh, uh, a picture today, and when we talk about Essex, it's, uh, it's something of which uh, uh, Harlow can be particularly proud. Nearby uh, uh, Harlowbury is Harlowbury Chapel, which was used for centuries as a barn, but is perhaps the original church for a minster parish on both sides of the Stolt uh, uh, <coughs> in that particular area. Now, 
within Parlow's present boundaries there is a wealth of ancient churches and picturesque listed buildings which go back centuries and constitute a most precious heritage. Churchgate Street, a most present, uh, most uh, 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 picturesque area, has numerous timber frame buildings, but part of the Churchgate Hotel is actually a medieval chantry. I remember driving down there with Gordon uh, uh, Marriott, who was in those one of the first chair of the councils, and he looked at some of that stuff which was very dilapidated. He said, we're going to get all that out of it and put in modern stuff. And I said, Gordon, how can you say that? That's beautiful. <coughs> Unfortunately, it was restored, and today, uh, uh, anybody who goes to Churchgate Street would, I think, agree uh, quite objectively that it's a very, very attractive area. And uh, uh, all over the town, we have a wealth, as I say, of listed buildings. <coughs> Netswell <coughs> was held, the parish of Netswell was held by Waltham Abbey, just as uh, uh, Old Harlow was held by Berenson, El, El, uh, Berenson Edmonds. It was held by Waltham Abbey, which of course was another uh, monastic institution. And uh, there is in Netswell, as uh, those of you who go around the town will know, a magnificent medieval barn. Uh, uh, there are also the fish <coughs> ponds there, which originally were used to produce fish to feed the uh, 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 inhabitants of the area. And uh, it's been uh, uh, developed today, and it is a most attractive area. And, uh, <coughs> Pandon Mill, Great Pandon Church and the neighbouring areas are also part of our invaluable heritage. In the 17th century, when Charles I was overthrown by the parliamentary army, the army was actually stationed at Saffron Walden and its units were billeted out at all the surrounding villages, including Harlow, Nasing, and Royden. And uh, there was, on this occasion, uh, there, uh, uh, there was a man who seems to have come from Hoddesdon, who was a chaplain to the army, and he was appointed to be a lecturer, or a Puritan lecturer, at Southwold. When, in fact, the uh, re revolution was brought to an end, and you've got the uh, restoration of Charles II in 1660. This man, William Woodward, Woodward, was sacked, and he came back and took a farm in Nazing, and he then established <coughs> in the area the Baptist Church in Old Harlow, which used to be in a, in a barn, and there also a church at Little Pandon, which subsequently moved to Potter Street and the Potter Street Baptist Church built in 1759 is today, <coughs> is there today. And uh, both congregations are in fact still going. So you can see that Harlow itself has a very rich legacy from the past. Most of the land on which the new town was built was devoted to agriculture for centuries, of course. In the Middle Ages, it was cultivated <coughs> largely by serfs who were tied to the manors on which they lived and were obliged to cultivate their law's land in return for strips on which they grew food <coughs> from themselves. However, <coughs> the open fields were largely enclosed by the 17th century although the 1660 map of Harlow, which I purchased and a copy of which is just out here, shows that up in the north of Harlow, there were still strips around where, uh, the temple site. If you look at the map, you'll see them. 
really dating back to the Middle Ages. The Lord of the Manor in the early 19th century, Montague Burgoyne, was the improving farmer who wrote to Arthur Young, the great advocate of the agricultural revolution, about his new improved methods. In addition to agriculture, however, there were other industries based in Harlow in this period. The 16th and 17th century records reveal that cloth was produced and woven here, although not on the scale that uh, was the case at Colchester, Coggershall and other uh, further parts of Essex further east. Harlow became the centre of a flourishing pottery industry in the 17th and 18th century based at Potter Street and its, uh, and its environs and it produced metropolitan ware, examples of which you can see on display at the museum. It was destroyed effectively by competition from uh, uh, Stoke-on-Trent and the potteries who could produce a better quality ware in the later 18th century. Another uh, uh, important industry in Harlow was malt production from barley, which was important all over northwest Essex and East Harts. And uh, if you go to Old Harlow uh, uh, in Market Street, just by St John's Church opposite, you'll see that one of the old maltings has in fact been uh, 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 de redeveloped <coughs> by uh, John Graham actually and is used as the uh, uh, campus of the foundation of uh, uh, Newfoundland. Uh, my house, the Lees, was actually built onto the end of Reed's moulding and uh, the end wall, although covered up, is actually still an 18th century house from a malting. The malt industry was one of the de reasons for the development of stalk navigation which was used to transport barley down from London and coal to Harlow where in and other and Bishop Stortford and elsewhere and then to take the malt back to London for London breweries. <clears throat> London uh, Harlow was in addition be it to being re reached by uh, the stalk navigation it was in fact reached by a railway which came through in 1841 and put the town on the line going from Shoreditch to Suffolk and Norfolk. There were two stations, Burnt Mill, which is now Harlow Town, and Harlow, which is now Harlow Mill. Now in the 19th century, the Arkwright family, descended from Richard Arkwright, <coughs> the, enter of the, water fr uh, the inventor of the water frame and the pioneer of textile factories in Britain. He left his uh, great wealth to his son Richard. Richard had six sons and Richard Arkwright, the son, set up each of his sons with a landed estate and his youngest son, his sixth son, Joseph, who lived from 1791 to 1864, the grandson of the inventor, was in fact endowed with Mark Hall. The family purchased more land and lived at Parndon Hall as well as Mark Hall, but after the designation of Harlow as a new town in 1947, <coughs> they sold their property, as they were obliged to do, to Harlow Development Corporation. <clears throat> Down to the Second World War, Harlow and the neighbouring parishes remained a largely rural and agricultural area in which the community looked up to the landowners and the clergy as its natural leaders. I came into the area to North Weald in 1939 
and I remember cycling over the area and Ty Green was a little tiny hamlet and everywhere and of course the uh, uh, people who dominated the area were of course the landed gentry and the squires. Well in 1945 after six years of war a wind of change was blowing. The old Epping constituency consisting of Harlow, Epping, Waltham Abbey, Loughton, Chinkford and uh, Chickwell and Woodford and Wanstead had been represented in Parliament since 1924 by Winston Churchill. It was split for the 1945 election and much to everybody's surprise the northern part, Epping, including Harlow, was won by Mrs. Leah Manning in the 1945 general election. I remember that very well and the excitement which it caused. She was a former teacher and a woman, of course, and uh, everybody, and she made a tremendous impression on the area. And the swing to the left was also reflected in elections to the Harlow and adjacent parish councils, <coughs> and also to the Epping Rural District Council, which was the local authority. Now the idea of building new towns, or garden cities as they were originally called, was first put forward by Ebenezer <coughs> Howard, a shorthand writer who became a social re reformer. He believed that people were degraded by living in overcrowded <coughs> slums and needed access to the countryside and to nature to lead more fulfilling lives. He was responsible for the creation of Letchworth Garden City in <coughs> 1903 and Welling Garden City in 1920. And Ebenezer's uh, name is perpetuated in Harlow as Howard Way. <coughs> in the 1920s and 30s about the way in which London was expanding on all sides and encroaching on all the green land and actually in 1938 the old LCC managed to put through Parliament the Green Belt Bill which in fact uh, uh, prohibited building on a green belt around London. In 1943 the Ministry of Town and Country Planning was established to oversee uh, post-war planning and it appointed Professor Patrick Abercrombie, commemorated in Abercrombie Way here, to prepare a Greater London Plan. Crombie examined the situation and he proposed building ten satellite towns around London beyond the Green Bell. In Essex at Harlow, Anger and Margareti. Now immediately this was announced there was a tremendous reaction locally in Margareti, uh, Anger and uh, Harlow to oppose any new town coming to the area, which you might uh, uh, expect. Now, the new Labour government elected in 1945 appointed Lewis Silkin, who had chaired the LCC's Town Planning Committee, as the Minister of Town and Country Planning. <coughs> he appointed Lord Reith of BBC Frame, a fame to chair a new town's commission on which Sir Frederick Osborne, a champion of garden cities, served, and this outlined proposals which were implemented by the New Towns Act, first introduced into the House of Commons in April 1946. Now, Liam Manning, 
Harlow's new MP, despite the opposition that was generated locally, made it quite clear in the House of Commons that she was in favour of building a new town at Harlow. In the, she said, in the constituency which I represent, I hope, indeed almost pray, we shall have at one end a new town. The alternatives which <coughs> force the country planners, face the country planners of the day, are either to build on green belts and beautiful open spaces or to build new towns. In Harlow, uh, in Harlow, I envisage the possibility of a central town, a fairly small town, with those farms around and smaller towns or neighbourhood units surrounding it. The proposals for new towns were approached in Harlow by a defence association formed with a local farmer, Leonard Radbourne, in the chair. This, in fact, countered the views of Leah Manning. But a number of people locally then came forward to support the idea of a new town. Ted Woodlands, who was the unlikely chairman of Netswell Parish Council, which had been Conservative for years before that, collected a petition of signatures in support of a new town and organised a public meeting on the 30th of October 1946, to which he invited Lewis Silkin himself. A public inquiry was held in the <coughs> drill hall where a legal challenge was rejected and Bill Fisher, another Labour Party member, presented another petition in favour of the new town. The appeal against the decision <coughs> was withdrawn and on the 25th of March 1947, 70 years ago today, Harlow was designated as a new town along with Stevenage, Crawley and Hemel Hempstead.